Hi, my name is Nathan Diaz Leal, and I'm a senior at Southern Illinois University Carbondale in the Automotive Technology Program. And today I'm going to be going over VVT, Variable Valve Timing Phasers. So specifically, I'm going to be going over their operation, their purpose, and what happens when they fail, and how to diagnose these issues. For those technicians out there that already kind of suspect a failing variable valve timing phaser, feel free to skip ahead to the timestamp in the video. Before I get into any of the variable valve timing phaser operations and the purpose, I need to go over some basic engine mechanical and how the four-stroke cycle works. So if you already know and have an understanding of how the four-stroke cycle works, feel free to skip ahead to the timestamp in the video. Okay, so what is the purpose of an engine? So the purpose of an engine is to make work, power, and torque. So how does an engine do that? An engine does that by combusting an air and fuel mixture inside a tight space, which is called the combustion chamber. So the bottom part of this combustion chamber is called the engine block. And inside the engine block, we have cylinders. And the purpose of a cylinder gives us like that amount of air that's gonna be able to get squeezed and it's gonna be combusted. So then we have the piston, and this piston is gonna push that. It's gonna push all this air all the way to the top of the combustion chamber. And once we ignite that mixture, it's gonna wanna push that piston down. So then we have the crankshaft, and this crankshaft is connected to the piston by a connecting rod, and it's going to rotate, and it's gonna translate that, re that reciprocating motion into rotational motion. So then now at the top of the combustion chamber, what we have is the cylinder head. So this is gonna be that top part of the combustion chamber where, that com where all that combustion event's gonna occur. We'll have the spark plug in there. And what we're gonna have next is the valves. So these valves are gonna open and close and they're gonna let that air in and exhaust out. So right here we have an example of a valve and it's valve assembly. We have the valve spring, the rocker arms. We may even have you know push rods or lifters or even, you know, tappets and things like that. So what's going to drive the valve is, is this camshaft. And the, and the valve is going to ride right here on this cam lobe and it's going to open and close that valve. So all these components need to be able to work together and be operating at their specific times. We wouldn't want you know, a valve to open at the wrong time and it lets combustion out and things like that. So what we have, and if what we have to control that is called timing and we have timing components. So as you can see on this camshaft, we have the cam sprocket. And then we also have a crank, we also have a crankshaft sprocket. And this is all connected by a timing chain or timing belt. So now I'm going to go into explaining how do all these work together? Because there's different ways that they work together. We have the four stroke cycle, or we even have a diesel cycle. There's different variations of these cycles but I'm mainly, going, I'm mainly going to focus on the four-stroke cycle. So the four-stroke cycle, where a stroke is the distance traveled by the piston inside the cylinder, is a four-step process, intake, compression, power, and exhaust. This process is used to combust an air-fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber. Here I have a cutout of an engine that I will use to explain the four-stroke cycle and a front view of the engine that I will use to explain how the timing components work together. This engine is a four-cylinder engine and it is a single overhead cam with a clockwise rotation when viewed from the rear. So let's begin the four-stroke cycle and let's say that my arm is the starter. So the starter cranks the engine and the intake stroke begins. The crankshaft will begin to rotate and also turn the camshaft which opens the intake valve and closes the exhaust valve. As the piston begins to reach the bottom or bottom dead center, this creates a slight vacuum and pulls air in. The crankshaft will then complete about 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation and the camshaft will complete about 90 degrees. With the help of the starter and the, some rotational inertia, the crankshaft will continue to rotate past 180 degrees and start the compression stroke. As the piston reaches the top or top dead center, the intake valve will begin to close and the air fuel mixture will begin to be compressed. So by the time the piston reaches the top dead center, the intake valve is closed and the crankshaft will complete around 360 degrees of rotation. The camshaft will be around 180 degrees of rotation and the air fuel mixture will be ready to be ignited. The crankshaft will then continue to rotate past 360 degrees and the ignition source will ignite the mixture. This will begin the power stroke. The expansion of gases from the burnt 
from the burnt air fuel mixer, we begin to push the piston to bottom dead center, completing 540 degrees of crankshaft rotation and 207 degrees of camshaft rotation. The crankshaft will then rotate past 540 degrees and push the piston up. This will begin the exhaust stroke. The camshaft will continue to rotate and open the exhaust valve and let exhaust out, and the piston will reach top dead center. So now at the end, the crankshaft is at 720 degrees of rotation and the camshaft is at 360 degrees of rotation and the whole process starts again. Now that we've gone over some basic engine mechanical theory and some four stroke cycle basics, let's get into variable valve timing. So what does the phrase variable valve timing mean? So variable means changing and valve means that engine component that lets air in and out of the cylinder and timing means like the relationship between when we let the air in and when do we let the air out of the cylinder according to the crankshaft position. So putting that together, variable valve timing means changing how long the valve stays open and when do we open the valve according to the crankshaft position and load and all the other, all the other uh, factors. So there is also a variable valve timing list where we can change how wide the valve opens, but that's for another video. So why do we need to change it? Why do we need to change the valve timing? What's the whole point of that? So pretty much at higher RPMs, we kind of lose some efficiency and we kind of lose control of the valves a little bit. If we're able to actually control it to some extent, then we would have more efficiency at higher RPMs. We can actually take advantage of, you know, have take advantage of load and such like that. So going off of efficiency at lower RPMs, you know, we're able to actually have and create a scavenging effect where if we're able to control the position of the intake valve and the exhaust valve, we may actually let air just gradually get inside the cylinder. And also, it helps with emissions. You know, we're able to create an EGR effect. So that means that we're able to open up, you know, the intake valve and then close it a little early and then let the exhaust valve a little bit open during that intake stroke. And we're able to let some exhaust go in during the compression stroke and then we have, uh, we've lowered combustion temperature and then now we're lowering NOx and we're also lowering some emissions too. So then also we can get more bang out of the buck. So pretty much if we actually close the intake valve sooner during that compression stroke and let some air out, we actually change that compression ratio. So what was, what's actually happening is we're actually using less amount of air for more power. So we're actually gaining efficiency. So those are kind of some basic reasons why we would need that. So how do we implement those changes? How do we work on that? So instead of using a typical timing, camshaft timing gear, we now use a phaser like this on this camshaft. So this phaser is, um, lets the camshaft actually rotate on its own. So we do that by applying oil pressure. So looking at the inside of this VVT phaser, we're able to actually change the position of the camshaft. So we would do that with a variable valve timing actuator. And that actuator will let oil into the chamber and actually change the uh, position of the camshaft. So we're able to advance or we're able to retard. And if I could take this apart without letting things fall out, I can actually show you on the inside, there are actually little oil holes. And those oil holes will let the oil into the chamber and actually begin to, you know, rotate the, rotate the whole camshaft phase. In. For example, on here, you can see I can actually rotate the cam itself, but now it just locked in there because there's also a, it's also a locking mechanism too. So with that, I also want to show you an example. So let me get into an animation of how the oil actually gets into the chamber and how it actually rotates the camshaft. So the BVT phaser is composed of a rotor, housing, return spring, or lock pin assembly, and carbon seals. The housing has gear teeth and is connected to the timing belt or timing chain. The veins fill up with oil, which oil will then push off the housing and rotate the rotor that then rotates the camshaft. The housing may be bolted to the return spring and rotor assembly and kept under tension. So the return spring will help return the rotor back to its original positioning, pushing out any oil inside the vein. 
A lock pin is used to hold the rotor to the housing during startup. Oil will then release the lock pin and fill the veins up with oil, liberating the rotor. This will prevent noise and excess wear during startup. The VVT oil control valve solenoid controls the distribution of oil to the VVT phaser. The solenoid will move a spool valve to let oil in, which this is pulse width modulated by the PCM, and the PCM will look at various engine sensors like cam and crank and different parameters to adjust accordingly. Let us say that you want the engine to be more efficient at low RPMs and reduce pumping losses. The engine needs to retard its intake timing because closing the intake valve later will let air get pushed back into the intake manifold and reduce engine vacuum. To do this, the oil control valve will push the spool valve in. Oil supply will then flow through the spool valve into the camshaft and into the phaser locking pin, which will unlock the VVT phaser. Oil will then fill the retard chambers or vanes, which the oil will rotate the rotor and the camshaft will rotate. The intake valve will now close later. So what if now you want to just reduce NOx emissions? You could do that by advancing the intake valve timing and opening it during the exhaust stroke, which will let some exhaust back into the intake manifold, creating an EGR effect. To do this, let's say the retard chambers are still filled with oil, so the oil control valve will have to drain the oil by returning the spool valve back out with an internal spring, and oil will then be pushed back into the camshaft and past the spool valve and into the drain passages. Then the spool valve will have to move further and let oil supply back through the spool valve into the camshaft and into the phaser locking pin, which will unlock the VVT phaser. Oil will then fill the advanced chambers or veins, which oil will then rotate the rotor and the camshaft will rotate, so now the intake valve will open sooner. So there are different ways to adjust valve timing, like closing exhaust valves late or early or closing the intake valve later or early, which pretty much this just gives us more control over the engine. And the more control we have, the more efficient we can be. Now that we know how the VVT phaser works, let's get into how they can fail, what are some symptoms that pop up, and how to diagnose these issues. The VVT phaser will fail mechanically, and this will cause noise and overall poor performance. This is also associated with a P0011 to P0025 codes, which usually talk about the VVT phasers or the control valves being under poor performance or not advancing at the right time or taking too long to advance. This will actually cause uh, an uneven idle and s sometimes hard to start and stalling overall. So the things that really fail is the veins. And right here, as you can see, these veins prevent, you know, they don't want to let oil pass through the veins when they're switching. So once they fail, it may become harder for the actual VVT phaser to, you know, to switch to advance or to retard. So another part of the veins that actually can fail are the vein seal springs. And these tiny springs, as you can see right here, these provide tension and they push they push the veins against the walls, as you can see here. So if that spring were to wear out, then the vein, then the, the vein seal won't be able to do its job. Another thing that can fail is the return spring. So if the return spring were to fail, as you can see here, this one's kind of loose because it's not under tension, but if it, let's say it were to fail, it wouldn't be able to go back to its original position and it wouldn't be able to, you know, to be able to switch fast enough. It would reduce its response time. Another component that can fail, which is quite common, is this, is this pin right here, this locking pin mechanism. So if this thing were to fail, at startup you would get a lot of noise, and then it would go away. So right now, listen to this video where I have an example of what happens when the lock pin fails. This clanking noise is really caused because the locking pin isn't really able to, you know, it isn't able to actually get attached to the housing and then it's just, when you start it up, it's just doing this, shaking and shaking until the oil pressure builds up and then it's actually able to, you know, to switch slowly and then you won't hear this dry, these dry metals hitting each other. And pretty much the biggest cause of premature failure for the VVT phaser is actually oil. So if we have low oil pressure or bad oil quality or even improper oil viscosities, the oil passages that are, you know, that are right here inside of the camshaft and inside here and also inside of the phaser and even right here on the other sides of the phaser too. So if those were to get clogged up, 
then oil can't pass through and then it's going to do the same thing, just start clacking together. And another thing that can get clogged is actually the oil control valve screens. As you can see right here, these little screens protect like metal from getting into the phaser. But if these were just to get clogged up with a bunch of metal, then we're not able to actually let enough oil flow through and it would also reduce the response time of the VVT phaser. So that's why oil changes in new vehicles, especially with VVT, are, is very important. So that's one of the first things you'd want to check when diagnosing these VVT phasers. So how would we pinpoint a failing VVT phaser? Well, let's get into diagnostics. So how would we diagnose a failing VVT phaser? To begin, we can listen for clacking noise near the timing chain or timing belt cover during startup or while the engine is running. It may help to remove the timing belt cover and watch the VVT phasers in action. Pulling out DTCs can help identify a direction, but sometimes there are no DTCs or the DTC diagnostic steps are unclear. An easy first step should be to check the oil. Dirty oil can clog the oil control valve and the oil passages, preventing oil from reaching inside, creating a noise or a faulty phaser. Low oil or low oil pressure can have the same effect. If the oil is okay, we can use a scan tool to activate the VVT OCV and watch for normal changes in cam angle. The cam phase actual and the cam phase desired should be similar. Large variances can show a slow and faulty cam phaser. We can also use the scan tool to help expose a clacking phaser, like in this video. The scan tool can be useful and easy to use, but during some intermittent issues, it may not help as much. An oscilloscope can help show the phaser operation in detail. For example, I hooked up a Pico scope to this 2006 Nissan Sentra. Channel A is the cam sensor, channel B is the oil control valve, channel C is the crank sensor, and channel D is the cylinder 1 ignition coil primary current. From the service information, I was able to identify where 0 and 70 degrees of crank rotation are. I also use the software to break 720 to 180 degree steps, which each peak is about 5 degrees. I can then activate the oil control valve and watch how the cam angle changes. At normal idle, the cam is about 5 degrees of crank or 2.5 degrees of cam rotation off the long pulse. And then after activating the OCV, the cam is about 4 degrees of crank or 2 degrees of cam rotation off. In total, it moved about 9 degrees of crank rotation or 4.5 degrees of cam rotation. I can then compare my findings to a known good waveform or to, the, or to the scan tool and see the differences. There are also different ways to check the VVT phaser with the oscilloscope. We could also rev the engine and watch how the degrees change and determine the phaser response time. So an oscilloscope gives us many different options and a more detailed report, but it does take some practice and some time to hook up and use. So hopefully after this, you'll have a better understanding on how to diagnose a failing VVT phaser. Together, we have gone through basic engine mechanical theory and the four-stroke cycle basics. We've gone over VVT phaser operation and purpose, and also VVT phaser failures and diagnostics. Hopefully, this video was helpful to you and very informative. Feel free to leave a comment below, and don't forget to like, like and subscribe. Thank you again for your time.